Father God, right after in Christ alone, towards the middle of the back. I'd like to say before I begin how much I appreciate so much. I think this is the first year that you've done this, and I hope that uh, it's been a benefit uh, to you to come and, uh, and to sit and to study and to think about some of these things, and hopefully that uh, if this goes on that it will grow and other young people will come and, and be encouraged by what uh, the church here and the elders are trying to do. And I, I just appreciate so much being invited to be a part of it. I, I count it a great honor. Uh, you may have heard the story about a man who survived the 37 flood. I don't, you young people probably don't relate to the 37 flood, but there was a, a flood in this country in 1937. And this man got to heaven, and he told the Lord, he said, Lord, I'd like to get up and preach a sermon to everybody about surviving the 37 flood. And the Lord said, well, uh, that will be okay. But he said, you have to remember one thing. And he said, what's that? He said, Noah is going to be in a crowd. And so sometimes you might think, as Kenny said, you know, things you have experienced are big. And somebody comes along and you realize that, you know, I haven't been challenged very much. But you don't know what's down the road. And that's why we're trying to tell you. I have got a lot of friends and people that I went to school with who have, have uh, lost their lives from drugs and alcohol and been killed in car wrecks from doing crazy things. And uh, in the Vietnam crisis, a lot of them who were lost there and came back from Vietnam with their mind uh, destroyed from drugs. And so uh, I haven't been challenged a whole lot, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. You know, when you begin to look in the Bible, you wonder why, for example, Saul's conversion, Acts the 7th chapter, at the end of that chapter when Stephen is taken out, thrown out of the city and stoned to death, the Bible says that the people, the witnesses, laid their coats at the feet of one named Saul. And when you turn to the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, you see Saul breathing out havoc and threats against the church and, and going out them with permission from these elders to arrest brethren and to put them to death. And, and so this was the kind of monster we see this religious man Saul being against the Lord's people until the ninth chapter comes. And the Lord meets Saul on the road to Damascus. 
at noonday when a bright light is shining. And we find that Saul realizes as he speaks, here's the Lord's voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, was Saul persecuting Jesus, or was he persecuting Stephen? Whenever people work against the people of God, the Lord takes that personal. And I've always said, I try to be careful not to fight the people of God, because the Lord takes note of that. And so what we see is the Lord revealed to Saul who he was and told him to go into Damascus. He would meet this preacher, Ananias, of course, and he saw in the vision, and that's what come to him. And uh, he would be told what he must do. Now, we might ask the question, why didn't the Lord just tell Saul himself? Because the Lord had commissioned us to tell other people. And so the Lord's not going to come today and tell somebody that we love or care about that they need to change their life. The Lord has commissioned us to do that. And so the Lord and the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts were bringing people together to do what the Lord said to do. And so we find when Ananias came to Saul, and Saul had been praying and fasting for three days. And I think I know what he was doing because I have traveled that road myself. I, I understand, I believe, what repentance is. And I uh, saw myself as a wicked, ungodly sinner who was doing a lot of terrible things. And my police force, which was my own conscience, was convicting me, and I changed my life. And I want to talk to you some about that. Before I do that, I want you to see in my Bible, this is a sticker that was given to me every day at the hospital. This is the one that says expired on the date below. I got these every day thinking that Scott was going to be expired. When we, we couldn't get from the Grand Canyon to the hotel for a couple of days, we had to drive back to Albuquerque, New Mexico because we'd rented a car from there. We got there too late to get a flight. We couldn't get back that night. And we flew back the next day. We thought the airport was going to charge us a lot of money, and they didn't do that. That didn't happen. But when we got there, Scott, we went in to see him. He was at least twice his size. He was so swollen, his head looked like a large card, uh, square box. And uh, they told us that it was touch and go, and they weren't sure what was going to happen. They tried to put his leg back, but it looked like that it might be that he was not going to make that. And so. Every day I was praying as I was sitting and looking at these stickers that they had given to me until the 18th day. That was when they finally told us it looks like Scott was coming out of the woods and that he was going to be okay. And so when I pray in the morning time, I open my Bible and I thank God. You know, all my boys are a blessing to me. I love them all. But I thank God that Scott's still here. And I see the good that he's doing. And so I, I, I'm standing in his shadow now. I, I think he stood maybe in my shadow a little bit. He was growing up. But I tell people that my children were amazing to me. I was not smart uh, in, by any means. I, I had some something wrong. I don't know what it was. I couldn't learn. I couldn't read. And I tell my boys when Scott and John, Scott was nine and John was 11, they got a paper out. And uh, first day we delivered papers. I went down the middle of the street calling out the numbers. I delivered papers all my life. And so they delivered the papers, and so uh, the next day I, got, I, I had a Bible study, got home late. I said, come on, boys, get the papers delivered. And, and John and Scott said, Dad, we already got them delivered. I said, boys, I said, I deliver papers all my life. You can't remember every house that gets a newspaper by delivering one day. And John said to me, Dad, we didn't remember all the houses that got papers. We just remember the four or five that didn't get papers. I never thought of that in my whole life. And I began to realize these boys are passing me up. And then so many things, uh, you know, they played sports. And back in those days, my wife and I, we tried to be ultra conservative. We knew if we were conservative, when we started, we could loosen up as they got older. But if we were loose at the beginning, we could never get a grip on it when they got to be teenagers. And so, you know, they played basketball, and I helped to coach. And, uh, and, uh, and Diane, the, uh, John, he's the oldest. John, Diane made some uh, trunks that were longer because back in those days, the trunks were short. When a boy fell on the floor, why you, you know, he... You just about see everything it was. And so uh, Diane decided she'd make those longer trunks, and she put a, a little insignia of the school on the, on the knee of it. And so uh, all the boys, uh, when John went, uh, they wanted to have those. And so they, they started, they wanted, all the boys wanted Diane to make them. So she did. Well, when Scott came along, a new coach had come, and uh, 
uh, he was there one day, and I had gotten there late, and they were in the shower area, and, and, and they were getting ready to start the season, and Scott had on those long trunks that John had wore, and, and he said, now, Scott, you're not wearing those trunks, and you're going to play basketball, you're, not, you're wearing the trunks that all the other boys are wearing, and, and so I, I, I knelt down, uh, uh, the coach had his arm up on the shower wall, I knelt down where, I, where he couldn't see me, but Scott could, and I, I saw Scott in there, and I was looking at Scott, and so Scott looked at me, and Scott said, uh, and coach said, Scott, get those off. And Scott said, well, sir, he said, if, if I can't play in these trunks, I, I won't be playing at all. And he said, oh, Scott, that's your dad. He's a preacher, and that's just your dad's stuff. To, you don't need to have the conviction. Your dad and Scott said, no, sir, it's not the convictions of my dad. It's my own conviction. Now, Scott was in the fourth grade. But this coach, he said, come on, Scott, now you're not, don't you want to play? And Scott said, yes, sir, I want to play with all the Timmy. He said, well, come on. And so Scott said, no, sir, I, I can't. I just can't. My conscience won't let me do it. And so this coach got aggravated, and he turned and said, okay, you can wear them. But he turned around, and he, there I was right in his face, you know. And so he said to me, he said, I don't know what you have done to your children. He said, I've never seen children that have their own convictions about something. And then I tell about it as Scott grew up in, in the sixth grade and got to be an old person and was playing football. We were in the playoffs, and I was helping the coach, and they – they always had the playoffs on Wednesday night, and I told them, I said, listen, if you all had the playoffs on Wednesday night, I said, at halftime, I'm going to have to leave and go to church. I said, y'all can do what you want. So they had the game on Wednesday night. On Thursday, we were in the playoffs. And so I told Scott, we were just before halftime, I said, now, Scott, I, after about two, three plays, after the halftime's over, I'm going to walk around into the car, and I'm going to go on to church. I'm going to church. And so I said, you've got to make up your mind. And so... After I started walking down there after they went back out. Scott was out on the field. And he was counting cadence, getting ready to hike the ball. He saw me walking by the goalpost. Well, Scott just stopped and took off, run through the line, and started chasing toward me. And the referee threw a flag and said, what's going on? And somebody in the crowd hollered, they're going to church. <laughs> and somebody said to me, well, what would you have done if Scott hadn't come? Well, it would have been different. But I always wanted my children to think, you're doing it because it's you. Not because it's your dad. I didn't try to, I always made them think, you got to make up your mind. Now, if Scott would have stayed, I'd have probably went back and said, Scott, come on, boy, we got to go, son. But you see, he did that on his own. And so my boys just always have done things like that because my wife and I have tried to give them the direction to see that you've got to make your mind up about that. And so Scott is, you know, what he has become and what he is, I, I really, I, I hate to say it, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I suspected that he would be something great somewhere, somehow, no matter what he did. And I think that all of us need to see the potential that we have. And when you look at, at these people like Saul, and even look at somebody like me, who uh, at age 24, <clears throat> I, I mentioned I, I was addicted to drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and pornography. Those were my addictions at 24 years of age. I'd been married for five years, and I, I didn't know how to treat a woman. I didn't know what marriage was about. My wife and I were, were struggling some with uh, the union that we had together. And so uh, I went to work one day, and a man approached me, and he said to me, I had long hair, and I, I was wearing, back in those days, they wore these hippie beads back in the, in the 60s, you know. And so this fellow approached me after I'd gotten out of the military, and he said to me at work, he said, he said Gary, he said, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> I said, what's that? He said, if, uh, he said, do you believe that there's a God in heaven? Well, I didn't want to talk about religion because I had just got out of the military. I came home to this country, and uh, I was in nuclear missiles. I went through special forces. Uh, in those days, they had recondos. I, was, uh, I went through recondo training. And, and so uh, I had come back from overseas, and they said, listen, we, we you can go in the missile school and teach, or you can go every day and go around the state of Ohio, uh, Oklahoma and, and go through three or four burials every day because we got so many young boys coming home and we don't have anybody that wants to be involved in the burial process and we need a sergeant of arms. I said, well, whatever you all want. I'm a soldier. I'll do whatever you all want. They said, we want you to take these soldiers and go and do this burial detail. So every day I was hearing three and four sermon, uh, sermons of somebody dying. While I was there, my grandmother, who meant the world to me, who had a lot of influence on me as a young boy, she died while I was there. I couldn't go home at the time. I'd run out of time to be able to go home, and so I had to stay. And so uh, while she died, I was going through all that. I got out of the military, and so my conscience were killing me because I'd had, I'd had my grandparents who, uh, 
who were religious people. Uh, I told you about uh, maybe my grand, my great grandmother. Uh, I might have told you, maybe I didn't. She, uh, we'd go to the country and stay all summer. And when school picked up, we'd go to the city and uh, Louisville and go to school. Because my dad thought if we went to the big city, we'd really be smart. Well, it didn't work that way. But anyway, uh, my grandmother, every in the summer, she'd get, she'd say, "Go get my specs, hoss fly." That's what they called me because I was always flying around doing something. And, she, and so she put her glasses on. She laid them on her nose like that and looked over and said, Now, why did she want her glasses? She's looking over the top of them. But she pulled her glasses down, looked over them, and she said, Now, Hossfly, I want you to swear to me when you grow up that you're going to be a gospel preacher. I remember the first time that she did that. I looked at my dad and said, Dad, what's going on? He said, Oh, go on, swear so we can go back to town. So I said, Okay, Grandma, I swear I'm going to be a gospel preacher when I grow up. Now, you see... My grandmother, putting that little thought in my mind, it, it bothered me when I was growing up all along. And when I was in the military, we'd get high on drugs or alcohol. Everybody said, get away from Sandusky. As soon as he gets high, he wants to talk about God. My conscience was killing me because my grandmother had planned that. My other grandparents, my mother and father, they weren't religious. They didn't have much concern for God. But my grandparents put these things in my mind. And so when I came to thinking about what this fellow had asked me. I walked away from him, and I tried. I was hoping he would leave. Well, he didn't leave, and so I thought, well, I'm not intimidated by him. I'll go back, and I'll tell him what I think. So I went back up to him, and I said, I have always believed there's a God in heaven. He said, let me ask you something else. I said, what's that? He said, if you were to die right now, but the way you're living, what, you're, what do you think would happen to you? Now, this time, I went to the men's restroom, washed my face. I walked down along the side of the wall of the factory. I thought... <clears throat> I'll stay away, and he'll go and leave, and I won't have to answer that. But I got to thinking, now, wait a minute. I'm not intimidated by him. I'll just tell him the truth. So I walked back with him. He was still there. I said, I believe if I were to die right now, I'd go straight to hell. He said, I want to ask you one more thing. And I said, what's that? He said, does that bother you at all? And when he said that, it was like somebody stuck a knife right into me because it did bother me. It had been bothering me. I'd been kicking against the pricks for a long time. The golds of what God wanted me to be and do was always poking me and bothering me and upsetting my conscience. That's the great thing about a conscience. It's like a police force. Everybody's got one. When you do wrong, it bothers you. And thank God it does. And if you're not careful, you can, you can sear your conscience so it won't work anymore. That's the danger of it. But at any rate, I told that man, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to get off of the road to hell and get on to the road to heaven. I didn't know anything about religion. I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know anything about the gospel. I went home and got the Bible. I went and got the Bible on tape, got some CDs, and I went home and I, I shaved off all my long hair, shaved off my beard. Uh, I poured my alcohol down the, uh, the, the sink, and I flushed my drugs down the commode, threw my pornography in the garbage, and threw my cigarettes in the garbage. I sat down on the couch, and I was sitting there listening to the Bible, uh, and, and, and my wife comes in from work. And she looks at me, and she sees this big change in me. And she says, don't move. We'll get you in the mental hospital, and we'll see what happened to you, and we'll get you over. I said, no, I'm fine. She said, what's going on? I said, I'm on the road to hell. I'm going to get off of it. I'm going to get on the road that goes to heaven. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to change. I'm going to be different. <clears throat> I had a motorcycle. I sold it for half what it was worth. I gave him a shotgun. I gave him a fishing pole away. I even thought it was wrong at the time to have a mustache. I thought, that's got to be worldly. And so I'm going to not even have a mustache. You see, I didn't know anything. I was just ignorant. And so I started reading my Bible, and, and I listened to that over and over and over, way up in the night, and I would go to work. And so uh, I'd talk to everybody I could talk to, and I'd go to church, and anybody would ask me to go. And my wife and I began to have trouble in our marriage because, you know, uh, we, we would go to dances and things like that, and, and my friends would drink uh, while we were there. And so I thought, now, if I'm going to be a Christian, I shouldn't be doing that. And so the, her boyfriend, who she used to date before I got her, he was going to those dances too. And I, I, one night I said, well, I'm not going to go to the dance with her. So I stayed home, and I thought, you know, her boyfriend's over there. And I better think about why. So I thought, I better get over and see what's going on. So I went to the dance and sat down there at the table with all these beer bottles and everybody dancing, this loud music. I set my Bible down in the middle of the table, and while I did that, one of my friends who'd come back from Vietnam, he said, Sandusky, what are you doing, son? I said, I'm reading my Bible. He said, don't you know, boy, that that don't mix with this stuff? Get out of here. You shouldn't be in here with that. So if you're going to do that, don't come in here. And I thought, you know, that old boy's exactly right. This doesn't mix with that. 
Now, you see, I was learning some lessons just from my friends in the world, so I decided, I told my wife, honey, I, I, I said, I, I'm not going to go back to that. And I said, now, I said, I know you're having some trouble with me because I was, I was quoting the Bible to her every time she'd open a Coke bottle. I said, that reminds me of something Jesus said about when a man puts new wine in an old bottle. <laughs> and so every time I could find some way to quote the Bible to her, to try to influence her to see what I was doing, I was doing that, and she was just about to get weary of it, you know. And so she kind of talked like, you know, I'm not sure if we're going to make it through this or not. I said, well, we may, we may not, but I said, I'm going to tell you. I have not been what I should be. If you give me a chance, I'm going to see what this book says, and I'm going to do what it says, and I will probably be the best husband you've ever, you could ever have. But I said, if I don't do it, I won't be worth a dime anyway. And so I began to, and so then she began to kind of give in, and we began to go some places together. Now, we had encountered one of my uncles back when we were first dating. He was a member of the church, and he said to us one day, he said, Gary, where do you go to church? I said, I'm a heathen. And he said, Diane, said, Diane where do you go? She said, I'm a, well, she was a, she was a Roman Catholic. He said, well, you all better have a big time while you're living because you're going straight to hell when you die. And so I said, well, Sonny, that was his name. I said, where do you go to church? He said, I'm a member of the Church of Christ. And so he walked away, and I said, Diane, I said, you know, I said, I don't know if we're going to get married or what we're going to do. But I said, if we get married, and I, said, I don't know what we're going to do religiously, but if we ever become Christians, we never will set foot in the church of Christ. And she said, amen to that. And so we went away, you see, with this bad attitude uh, about the church. And then when I began to go to different churches, I, be, I finally, uh, by going to all these different churches, I began to see that some of them were teaching more what the Bible said than others were. And I began to realize, well, some of them are kind of going by the Bible. Some of them are, are way off. And I would, I would talk to preachers and question them, and they'd get upset with me. I said, I'm just trying to figure out what the Bible says. And so finally I decided that this one group of people was awfully close to the Bible because I knew I needed to be baptized. And so I thought my grandpa, who was a Catholic until he was 69 years old, he obeyed the gospel. And I thought, I'm going to go talk to my grandpa about that. So I went down to my grandpa's, and I said, Grandpa, I said, you know, Next Sunday, I think I'm going to be baptized in, in uh, such and such a church. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. I said, what are you talking about? Do you know what I have been? Do you know what kind of person I am, what I have lived? I said, I'm lost. I need to have my sins forgiven. He said, well, let me ask you something. He said, when they start worshiping God, what do they do when they sing praises to God? I said, what do you mean? He said, do they play an instrument of music like they did in the Old Testament? I said, they sure do. He said, well, what about that? I said, well, Grandpa, that's nitpicking to me. I said, I don't care about that. I'm concerned about being baptized because I'm lost. And my grandpa gave me my first taste of Bible authority. He said, why do you want to be baptized? I said, I can read in the Bible where people, when they heard the gospel, they were baptized so their sins could be washed away. He said, why do you want to nitpick about baptism and not nitpick about worship? He said, you should want to nitpick about everything God said. If God said it, it's important. And so I went away thinking, well, I need to think about that. Some. So I went to work and talked to a friend of mine. I found out he was a member of the church. And I said, I, I want to know what the Bible says about that. He said, I'll bring you a track. I said, it won't do me a bit of good. I can't read it. I said, read the Bible to me and tell me what it said. So he read these verses to me. And I said, well, I said, is that all it says in the New Testament? He said, that's it. I said, well, I guess I'll just, I'm going to find me a church of Christ to be baptized in. And so I told my wife, she said, well, I'm not going with you. And so I went, and uh, I found out later from the preacher, I, I got over there, I was so excited about this. I'd already made my mind up when they baptized me, I was going to come out of the water and going to shout, hallelujah, you know. And so I told the preacher, I, I said, you know, I'm, he, he, he came up and introduced himself to me. And I said, he said, who are you? I said, I'm Gary Sandusky, and I'm here to be baptized and stuff like that. Well, he looked at me like, what kind of nut is this, you know? I knew there were other things. I just didn't know what all they were. And so anyway, uh, he said, well, maybe we better talk this over a little bit. I don't know. And so he didn't want to baptize me. I could see that. So I thought that was on, a, a, I think, a Wednesday night. I went back on a Sunday, if I've got that right, and I made my mind up I was going to make this old boy baptize me Sunday morning. So during the invitation song, I went forward, and, and he came over and said, he said, what are you after? What do you want? And I said as loud as I could, I'm here to be baptized and stuff like that. And so he said, well, hush up, hush up, we'll baptize you. I said, well, I'm going to shout hallelujah. He said, you better calm down. People think you're a nut already. And so anyway, 
He baptized me. He told me later on we were in London preaching together years later. He said, you know, if I could have ever made up a list of people that I would have never baptized because I, would, I thought they would never be worth a dime to the Lord, you know whose name would have had the list of people who I baptized? He pointed at me. He said, I didn't think this fellow would ever be worth a dime to the Lord because he couldn't read. <clears throat> he seemed to be so confused. And so I began to go then <clears throat> and go through the process of what everybody goes through <clears throat> because I had been taught so many things and had so many ideas. Uh, when, 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 when springtime came, I went and bought my first sport coat. You know, I thought, well, these other guys are wearing sport coats. I'll get me a, So I got me a sport coat, and I got the Bible, and I went over and found out, well, you know, when we find the resurrection. And so I wanted to go over to my dad's house. I was trying to convert my dad and my stepmom, my brothers and sisters. So I went over there on Sunday morning. I said, y'all get out of bed. You all know that this is Easter. Y'all need to get up and go to church. And I said, let me read to you. And I had memorized that, those statements in the Bible. So I, I kind of went through that and told him what it was about. I said, yeah, come on, go to church. Well, I went to church, and the preacher got up and got his gun out and pow, shot me out of the seat and said that, you know, we don't know anything about Easter. That word was added in the King James translation in Acts 12 chapter. And really it's the word Passover, and we don't know anything about that. And so people have made something out of that that God didn't tell us to do. And I got up, and I stomped out toward the back and slammed the door. And one of the elders came out and said, Gary, where are you going? I said, I can't believe it. I don't believe in Easter uh, and, and the resurrection of the Lord. And, and the elder said, now, Gary, do you remember what you told me when you were baptized? I said, yes, sir. He said, what did you say? I said, I'm going to follow the Lord through thick and thin. I don't care what it takes. I'll do whatever the Lord wants me to do. He said, now, you go home and think about what you said. And you go home and think about what the preacher said. And so I went home and thought about that, and, and I, I kind of reconsidered the fact that, you know, he didn't really say he didn't believe in the resurrection. He just didn't say what I thought. About. So anyway, we went through that, and then we went on down the road a little bit. Uh, well, I, I guess it might have started, I guess it started with Christmas. It started, I, I was baptized in November. So uh, December the 25th, I went to my dad's house, and I got, you all need to come to church with me. You know, it's the Lord's birthday, and you need to come. And so I went to the building, and the preacher <laughs> shot me out of the seat. And I thought, what in the world? These people don't believe anything in the Bible. But I began to realize everything I thought had come from some other source than what the Bible said. And so I went through the process of a changed life. And, and I, I can remember... Uh, some of my friends who were using drugs and alcohol, and they were, they were kind of saying, you know, you're not going to make it, Gary. You, you, you're going to fall. You just can't make it. I said, no, I'm going to make it. And I talk to people all the time who struggle with drugs and alcohol and pornography, and, and they say, you know, I, well, what did you do? I said, I did one thing. I made my mind up. I was not going to quit. No matter what, how tough it was, I was not going to quit. And I think when people see the power that's in your mind, and the power of what we believe, if we believe it, is so powerful. It can change a monster like Saul and a monster like Gary Sandusky. It can change anybody. But you see, we have got to believe the gospel. That's what it is. But when we finally become convinced that that's what it is, and we make up our mind that we're going to, we're going to do it, you've got to make your mind up. And you know, I... I told my boys, I was in the military, as I said, and in special forces. And so really, they grew up in a military camp. My daddy was a Marine, and I grew up in a military camp. My daddy, when I was nine years old, he said, I'm not going to spank you in this baby. We're just going to have a fist fight. And I said, okay. And so I did something one day. So I said, he said, put your fist up. And I said, okay. So I tried to jab at him. Well, he beat the fire out of me. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we're in a fight, but don't you try to hit me back. And so that's how I got my discipline. But you know something? That's all my daddy knew. My daddy was not taught about God. He didn't know about how to train a child. My mother ran off and left when I was a young boy. And, uh, and so my grandmother had to go away because uh, she was trying to help my mom some, and my dad found out about it. And so my world, at about age 16, it just it disintegrated, and I decided I was going to become the most ungodly person who ever lived. I didn't think anybody cared. I felt like that nobody cared about me. And so my life took a long dive until age 24 when I finally got on track. But I want you to see, young people, the joy and the happiness. What, what your children in time, you might be sitting here not even married and think, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get serious, but let me tell you, you're going to have a child someday, and you're going to sit on a seat back. 
And he's going to have a child someday. And that child's going to sit on a seat back. And you're going to see as your life goes on, you're just going to see how God blesses you. Wave. We have received grace upon grace, the, 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 the Gospel of John says in the first chapter. It just keeps waving over you. I, I, I would have never imagined my life would be so rich. I'm, I'm such an unskilled, ignoramus type person. I go all over the place and talk to people everywhere. Why does God use somebody like me? I'm amazed that God would use somebody like me. Now, I can see why you'd invite Scott. But why would somebody use somebody like me? It's because of the power of what I believe. It is in me. And if you make up your mind, okay, I'm tired of fooling around. And I'm tired of doing what everybody thinks we ought to do. And I, and I said, we can look at all the religions around us and what they're caught up in, or we can get this book in our heart and in our mind. And when we do that and become convinced by it, let me tell you, the road is so rich. The treasures. I'm one of the richest people in the world. You couldn't, if you gave me a million dollars a day, it would not make me one dime richer than I am already. You can't make me any richer. You can't defeat me. You can't destroy me. You can shoot me and kill me. I, I tell about a preacher. We were in, in Nigeria, and some men were, there was no security in, in Nigeria. We were there, and these bands of men were going around with guns and, and robbing people and hurting them. And we got caught out in a place, and this fellow said, you know, they're going to kill us. And he said, I'm going to get out of here tomorrow. I'm going back to the States. I said, no, you can't. I said, we've come over here to preach the gospel. We're going to stay and get this work done. He said, listen, they're going to kill us. He said, doesn't that bother you? I said, that doesn't bother me at all. He said, now you know you're lying. I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, you tell me what bothers somebody like you if you're not bothered by somebody killing you. I said, I'll tell you what bothers me. I said, what bothers me is people in this country know how to hurt you. I'm worried about what they're going to do before they kill us. That's what I'm worried about. They know how to torture you and hurt you over here. But I want you to see that we really are invincible. We're indestructible. You can shoot me in the head. You can't stop me. You can't take from me. God is my helper. And if we get that into our head and we live it out, young people, think of what it would do to this, this church right here alone. If just one young person today decided, I'm tired of fooling around. I'm going to get focused on this thing and dedicate to it. You know, I, I tell about my older son, John, when I teach the, the caution of the third chapter, Somebody gave him a magnifying glass one time. He was, he was about seven or eight years old. And they showed him how you can take the sun rays and, and focus the sun rays and start a little fire. And I, I was sitting in my office. I got to think, that boy's out in the yard. He's kin to me. I better check on him. So I looked out the window. He'd had a pile of leaves in the front yard piled up. And he had that sun ray. And smoke was coming off there. I hit on the glass. And I went like that. And he, he, he stomped the fire and he put the thing in his pocket. Well, I sat back down went to study him. And I thought, you know, I better check on that old boy again. I looked out the window this time, and he had that he had that that ray focused on my car tar, and smoke was coming up off my car tar. So I had to go out there and take his glass away from him. But you know what he learned? If you take the sun rays and you bring them to a focal point, you focus the sun rays. You've got power. If you can take your life. And quit chasing after the wind, as Ecclesiastes says. And make up your, know, there was a cartoon when I was a boy growing up. It always tickled me and reminded me of a lot of people. This cowboy is supposed to ride off in the cartoon into the sunset. But he gets up so far and he runs across this way. And then he runs back over that way. And he rides back this way. And he goes over here. While he comes, and before long, a big cloud of dust goes up. And you can't see where the old boy went. I thought, that's what most people in America are doing. We're running in every direction. And it's why we can't get anywhere with God. We need to get on the horse and ride to the Father. And don't give up. Don't get off. Don't get discouraged. Don't get frustrated. You can make it all the way. And the amazing thing is that God will do something with your life. And when you get to the end of life, what are you going to leave behind? That's the marvel of it. I'm hoping to leave something when I'm gone in the mind of Kobe, I hope he'll remember. He'll probably get up here in 20 years and say, you know, man, my grandpa up here talking to you. His teeth was all gone. He had hearing aids and was blind. I'm his grandson. 
I'm hoping that's what happens to Colby. I'm hoping that's what happens to all my grandboys and, and that my granddaughters marry men who grow up, develop into elders. And I, I just am so hopeful that that's what God will do. Well, he can. I appreciate you coming, and I, I know I've not talked as long as I should have, but I'm going to shut up and just let you think about all that. Thank you so much for listening to me today.